ago, it's quite a long time. It's, um, I remember the co-op, I can end up pronounce it co-op, Himble Blower, they seem very hot. Yeah, they were they seemed to be rather racy bars that they signed. Yeah, they were brand new in those yes, days. Yeah. In, those, in those days. Yeah. <laughs> um, besides that, I seem to... I'm sure my, my, my long-term recollection is getting worse and worse, but it's, I seem to remember very good cafes. Yeah. And they're still original Los cafes, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the snow spot. Yeah, it's Lose pretty. Spot. It's right around the corner. I think we'll we'll go there maybe um, tonight after after dinner. Depends how long it takes, how long we stay in the restaurant. Right. So. One never knows these things. Yeah. But um, I feel we did a sort of intensive architectural tour of things. I assume at that time. Yeah. But um, I'm ashamed to say my my detailed memory of my last day 18 years ago is a little vague. Don't, don't worry, you'll refresh it soon. <laughs> it'll, it'll be refreshed. What, what, what's your main impression for uh, in, in Vienna today? I forgot, as I was saying, I forgot how kind of solid it feels. It sort of sits on the ground for yeah. a purpose. Yeah, it's that's a... Well, theory, common sense eating. It's, a, it's, it's a being polite to the animal. Once we knock them on the head, it seems sort of churlish just to eat the, the fillet. But to, to enjoy the innards and extremities. Yeah. So that's a kind of it's a kind of holistic approach to food. Um, sort of yes, the whole beast. And yeah. that, I mean also celebrating the fact that innards and extremities are delicious. Yeah. And it's expanding on your gastronomic possibilities of the beast. But also that reflects on um, following seasons, indigenous creatures. So it's uh, yes, it's kind of just seems to be kind of the appropriate way to cook. It's, um, it's not really, it wasn't thought up as a kind of, haha, no stelite. It's kind of, haha, no stelite, if that makes sense. <laughs> is, it, is it challenging to convince people that it's delicious? Uh, there's a slight hesitancy on the, the, the eater's behalf about the more kind of internal and, ext and external pieces of an animal. But um, fortunately, over time, they seem to be coming around to it. I mean, because we're cooking them because they're delicious. It's not because they're kind of they're wibbly and wobbly. It's, um, it's because of their, their taste and their. I mean, there's nothing finer or more sticky than pig's trotter or mm. more soothing than a plate of tripe. It's just got to be tried. There's some sort of there's that kind of um, the tripe, where it's like in it's sort of, uh, people have this innate fear of. So all these, once tried, you seem to win them over. It's just mm. getting them to try it, but. Um, they seem to be trying it. There's hope, the innards. It seems to work. <laughs> well, then, yes, so far, so far. Hopefully, more and more. Yeah. How is it? Could you tell me a bit of your story of why you studied architecture and why you, why you then switched to, to be a restaurant owner? <laughs> well, I'm still an architect. You're still an architect. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm distracted by kitchens. Okay. But, um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's more the fickle finger of fate. And it was, um, well, I, I wanted to be an architect, so I studied architecture. But when I was doing that, all my buildings were to do with, they first ended in feasts. Mm -hmm. And then they actually eventually became, ended up being recipes for buildings. And then I started cooking with some chums. We took over a restaurant on a Sunday and cooked for 200 people, pot of fur and cassoulet. And that was just because we wanted to cook, for, we just wanted to have a big room full of people eating out of big pots. Yeah. And then um, that led to, when I left architecture school, the restaurant offered me a job before an architect's office did. So it was, it was just fate really, it wasn't, it wasn't a conscious decision to go into kitchens. Was, I saw uh, also in your book uh, a, a photo where you where I could have a glue of uh, how the surrounding of St. John is, uh, is prepared, so I think it's more um, a very open space. It's very, very it was designed yeah. in a way that the potential was to do as little to, the building is wonderful, it's an old bacon smokehouse, so it has these five huge chimneys. And then there's that 
those chimneys around the courtyard and there's a sort of raised space which is the main dining room. So the design was actually doing as little as possible rather than actually as much as possible. Um, and it's, it's a very calm, calm space. It's, it's, it's designed, to, it's you having lunch is, 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 is the decoration rather than actually the, the architecture or the, the space. It's, 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 um, it's meant to be just a sort of straightforward eating hall that um, people can come and enjoy themselves and any kind of decoration is, is them actually having lunch rather than anything that we've sort of tried to adhere. Uh, oh yeah, there, there was this, this, yeah, but this, 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 this wall, never, never. Uh, 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 and Carpaccio. I think it's Libra in English. Eine Suppe zuerst, glaube ich, was gibt es dann? Am Anfang Tee, ah. Earl Grey Morning Tea und dann ein paar St ein, ein Stunden später äh, etwas sehr äh, Birchermüsli oder schöne Brötchen. Besser ist das. Und dann Mittagessen ist, ist äh, schön ja, Gemüse und sehr viel Vitamin durch, diese, durch den ganzen Tag. Was für eine Art von Armsuppe? Armsuppe gibt es keine Kürbissuppe. Hier bis heute. Hi, ich habe mich darauf gefreut. Ja, das nehme ich auch, bitte sehr, das wäre super. Ich weiß nicht, wie es ist. Es ist ein spezieller Salat, aber sehr, sehr. All the chefs are chefs. But then there's different chefs. But then there's, then there's chefs. We have a lot of chefs. <laughs> now I can't. Yes. Yeah. Everyone thinks he's a chef. Yes, and you get this by, you know, by the state. You, you can, by doing nothing, you are a chef. And you get special certifications and you get also titles, a lot of titles. You can be a, a, a chef. We never did these people who are in pension and they are going to be a chef. Medizinalrat. You can be a chef, medizinalrat. Or a, Herr, Herr, Herr Kaus. So, so. Hofrat, Hof, Chef, Hof, the most difficult thing in Austria is to write. Uh, Dr. Dr. Kaufmann, Kaufrat, Kommerzrat, Kommerzrat. Wer bestellt noch Speise in mir? Cooking. Oder bin ich schon der Chef? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is he cooking? Well, I don't want to eat it now. I don't know. But the other one, then I can control myself. Have a nice cream. No, flesh strudel soup. I'm, I'm caught between um, the worst parts of the pig. Design and the version, you know, it's your spoon and some interesting looking food. <laughs> I don't know what to do. You should taste it. No. No. <laughs> You will. You won't find heaven. I would say it's uh, a tasty space. It's too spicy for architectural correctness. Something like that. It's beyond you know, what we normally like of the place. Find correct. It's a very tasty area. There is a, in Austria a very special dish, very hard to find nowadays, called Schnepfendreck. A very special thing of this bird is that you cook the intestines, but uh, in France you still get Schnepfen, and in Denmark and in, in, in Scotland. So uh, I, had, I have had a menu with Schnepfendreck, and it's, it's a on the royal, the royal menus about time of, of Franz Josef, last emperor of Austria, he had it on his menu, Schnepfendreck. But the track is the track is the most. It's not what's inside, no, what is inside the test, that's it, the Darmfüllung. Yeah, the Füllung comes down. 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 Aha. And, and then the, 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 the half-digested, 
Yeah. And that gives it a very special flavor. You take the arm, that's the thin arm and the thick arm, that is full with it, right? The last arm you snip away, because there is already too much of it. And you braat it with the arm with the with the inhalt. What is what is what is so is quite strange is that uh, this is the royal uh, palace in yeah, a way, yeah? yeah. And you have the museum there, you have the parliament. It's all so yeah, centered. Very, yeah, yes, yeah, very, very compact. Good, yeah, yeah. Was that conscious or it just happened or? I think it was conscious. Yeah. I don't know. Really. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You're not an urban yeah. planner, eh? No. no. <laughs> and it was full of, uh, full of soldiers, of course, yeah, yeah. or not? No, no, no so people. No people. Yeah, okay. yeah. They were they were thinking that it was a good thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. And in, in winter. Uh, you can drink glue vine <laughs> you know it yeah yeah, yeah. i know yeah it's very famous yeah, also in holland yeah. uh, philip you you were uh, telling about the medieval structures in uh, switzerland eh? and when you compare it to these really you know brutal uh, axes and symmetric things you know how uh, does you, do you have something here uh, like this in switzerland no, I, I just explained that uh, in switzerland you have uh, only Middle Age and, uh, and modernity. And so you have no Renaissance or uh, 19th century uh, urban planning. Yeah. And so... Uh, also no Baroque. No, no Baroque. And, and so the city are very uh, cheap. It's very Middle Age uh, city. And so, uh, yes, when Aldo Rossi come from Italy to import postmodernism in Switzerland, they, he, don't find, uh, he doesn't find uh, uh, the plaza, uh, yeah. street, uh, axes, and things like this, like yeah. uh, postmodernists in Italy or in France, or yeah. in, and so it was. Um, uh, it was not really uh, about um, this Renaissance or uh, this big architecture. Yeah. It was more an atmospheric uh, uh, middle more, age, more, more intimate. Also, yes, yes, more uh, small thing, uh, small object uh, yeah. with a deformation of the um, of the geological things and so and. Uh, and so postmodernism become in Switzerland a kind of uh, yes a mood mood postmodernism something like this and uh, and the gene generation from uh, Herzog de Meuron and this kind of architecture are uh, postmodernism but atmospheric postmodernism. Yeah, Michael, how important is the uh, uh, question of taste for your architecture for your way of doing architecture? Yeah, you know this is a very Let's say it's a funny question. It's really a funny question because uh, usually an architect used to say uh, we're working on concept, we are thinking, have, have, we are having a you know a certain depth in our work, and so we do actually. I hope we do, and uh, nobody can deny that there is every time there is uh, a, a certain. Super subjectivity in it uh, because nobody can uh, escape from from his own body his own history his own experience so as an architect you have to realize that there is uh, your personal instincts and your personal uh, things you don't really realize in your intellect so especially because of that, I think there is definitely there is a question. The, the question of taste is uh, one which uh, everybody architect, every architect should uh, answer with a yes. Also, Architektur und Essen, muss ich sagen, 
weniger die Architektur, aber das Essen ist mir am, am allerliebsten. Ich, ich bin ein äh, Essen, aber die Wiener Architektur, für die ist Leibwand. Nein, ich, ich kann es nicht sagen. Ich habe ja, was einen Zusammenhang lässt sich herstellen oder Nein, ist kann, kann ich nicht. Aber ich muss nur sagen, Essen ist gut. Schaut euch meinen Bauch an, ich muss da aufnehmen, da ist der Bauch, ich nehme den Bauch an, siehst du, was da alles rein geht. Das ist an sich schon Architektur. Richtig, <lacht> richtig. Sehen Sie einen Zusammenhang zwischen Essen und Architektur? Ich bin ja Architekt. Super, ich habe in Deutschland studiert, Architektur. Verstehe. Versteht für Sie einen Zusammenhang? Eine erste Frage. Ja. Essen Was? und Architektur. Essen und Architektur. Das ist, das ist wenn, wenn man gemütliche Wohnung hat, dann kann man besser, besser essen. Das ist zusammen. Zusammen, es steht zusammen. Wenn man, zum Beispiel, wenn Baduinen, Baduinen in Zelt wohnen, dann haben sie nichts so zum Appetit. Aber wenn man in eine schöne Wohnung, warme Wohnung, und gemütliche kann man besser essen, besser gemütliche liegen und so. Meine Meinung, Nein, wirklich, das ist super. Wir fragen, ob Sie einen Zusammenhang sehen zwischen Essen und Architektur. Hat das was Gemeinsames? Das kann man nicht. Hat er Fasten? Es noch in 20 Minuten, ich kann nicht etwas essen oder trinken. Ramadan war da. Ramadan. Er kann ich nicht essen und so. Und, und wie setzen Sie das in Zusammenhang mit Architektur? Ja. Aber wie? Also, das weiß ich nicht ganz genau, aber schon. Okay. Dankeschön. Bitte. Bitte. Essen und Ei. Hat das was Gemeinsames? Das ist überfragt. architecture conference of changing strategies so when we uh, had this name uh, the principles of tasty spaces uh, a certain word was uh, irritating to some people uh, this is taste in connection with architecture rather difficult but there is some kind of taste for us in, in, in creating space and, and, and building and, and making architecture it is uh, it is a matter of perception. So uh, we thought we thought very much about about perception when we uh, search for a topic this year. And uh, we said we think about what are we enjoying. So what is the basic of of creating space or enjoying life? And so we come to uh, eating, cooking, eating, and. Uh, it was interesting because there are uh, similarities between uh, cooking and eating and enjoying food uh, and, and making architecture and creating space. And, and so um, today we are, we are asking our speakers to tell us about how they think space is created. And, and uh, I don't want to say too much about it so, because there are so different people who will talk uh, tonight, even though there are less as we expected. Uh, I'm just, uh, I just hope that it's going to be inspiring for everyone who, who uh, tries to think about creating space. First, thanks for this uh, wonderful turnout and we want to thank, uh, we want to thank Wook um, for having us tonight of course. 
and uh, thanks to the TU Wien and Hochbau I, Professor Asap, who unfortunately can't be here tonight, of course. Projects like these are very important and bring a lot to the educations of the students, that they have the chance to organize something themselves, that they have a chance to set up a field in which they can experiment, and they have a chance to come in contact with people um, from different disciplines and also um, from other geographies. So I think that um, it's important that these projects or this type of project is maintained on the university, uh, especially in this time of, of dramatic change. Tasty space. I mean, space is a sensual experience. We perceive it through our senses. We can only perceive it through our senses. But how can we taste a space? What is the taste of a space? This is a very interesting question, and I was very fascinated when it was brought up by the organizers. I thought, wow. And I began to think about taste. What is taste? One thing about taste is a very interesting sense. It's the most limited and maybe the most primitive of all senses. And um, it's restricted to four sensations. It's restricted to salt and sweet, to bitter and to sour. And there's no more to taste than those four sensations. But however, when we have a wonderful dinner or when we drink a great wine, we, we perceive much more. And it talks about how the, taste of, the sense of taste works. Maybe this is the way that space works. Can it not work in much the same way? Is, is it not about the complex interplay of different sensual, um, sensual experiences? It's a con the conspiracy of these experiences to create an impression. And that is what we might call the taste of a space. Our first panel tonight will be um, Paul Renner, an artist from Schopenhau, if I'm not mistaken, in Vorarlberg. Um, we have Michael Zinner. Uh, from Quercraft Architects. I think everybody's familiar with their work here in Vienna. And the third person on the pa panel tonight will be Martina Löw, a sociologist from Darmstadt. Can I, inter can I invite uh, Martina and Paul and Michael to join us here on the panel? And I believe that Paul will do the first presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, the Hellfire Touring Club, what the fuck is the Hellfire Touring Club? Prospectus. On the night of 8 November 2000, artist Paul Renner joined Medler Lucan and Durian Gray for dinner at Birdsley House, a palace of luxury in London's Portman Square. Their purpose was to celebrate the publication of the last volume in Lucan and Gray's triptych of perversion, The Decadent Traveler. The authors were now looking forward to years of happy, disgraceful retirement in their new home, El Periquito, a cabaret brothel in Old Havana. However, Paul had other ideas. As candles burned low, he outlined a plan so preposterous, so risky, implausible, and tainted with lunacy that its attractions were immediate and irresistible. In the hope of finding that exclusive Xanadu, the vanishing point of experience, where the aesthetic becomes the infinite, all the visions vanish and the five senses fuse into one. <coughs> Thus, the Hellfire Touring Club was born. Officers were elected, a constitution agreed, and toasts were drunk. Uh, so, from this point on, that was November 2000, we started a three-year journey through Europe. Palermo, if you go to Palermo, you must see the Catacombe di Cappuccini. Then we went up to Edinburgh to see the most beautiful restaurant in the world, the so-called uh, Decadent. Then we went to Napoli to admire the biggest charlatans in the world. Next, Dornach im Strudengau in Austria, where Strindberg lived, also a great fashionable absinthe drinker. Down again to Sicily, to Catania, uh, place number 10, we visited Prague 
uh, paid a visit to the last living surrealist, Ludwig Kundera. From there, we went down to the Rhone Delta to pray together with the gypsies at St. Marie de la Mer. Up again to Innsbruck, near Innsbruck, Schloss Ambras. Then to the great temple, to Gardone, D'Annunzio's house. He didn't like eating at all, and he had no idea about eating. He only ate drugs. Up, we went to Vienna, to the Tower of Madness, the Narrenturm. Then down to Italy again, to Cesualdo. Up to England again, West Wickham, to the Golden Ball. The Golden Ball is a, a round room, and it was only constructed to fuck with prostitutes there. And at least to Las Medulas in Spain, where we broke the seals of Kofta. Okay. So these journeys were very important to create one room, at least. The 20th city we came back was Vienna. And in Vienna, we created one room. that is a mixture, a mixture of all these journeys through Europe. And we titled the room the Hellfire Dining Club. It was an exhibition during the day and at night a restaurant. Good evening. Um, I just uh, trying something very personal since three months. Uh, I tried to live as a vegetarian and now I hope <laughs> to give you some other um, inspirations. I created the lecture on one topic which I guess should uh, be one of the very important ingredients in good food and in good architecture, and this is love. And I have a special receipt here yeah, from my students' times. Uh, it's spaghetti with carrots and tomatoes and uh, a few spices. And the main, main point of it is that it's say all, always the same facts. It's always the same uh, amount of spaghetti, of one tomato, one carrot, and so on. But it's never tasted the same. And this is uh, one of the most interesting things, which is depending on the context. And uh, I think um, this is, to a certain extent, a miracle. And uh, it is also something which we can influence as architects, but not everything we can. Because out there, when you create buildings, it's much fun designing, it's very hard building, and it's very important to, to, to stay to your own heart, and it's the same in food and in cooking. Uh, just remember the fact how often you're really stressful eating or not eating on purpose, and uh, this is the same uh, parallel to architecture. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for the introduction. The point of departure for this symposium is that the creation of tasty spaces can, as with a meal, be subdivided into recipe, process, and consumption. How we deal with spaces in everyday life must involve production and not merely reproduction. I will be explaining the act of production from the perspective of day-to-day -day spatial constitution. I will be taking my sociological role on this podium seriously and will be emphasizing the social character of this process in the hope that the architectural theory quest for the enjoyable or Paul Renner's love for the unenjoyable will not suffer too much from the sociological perspective on power relations. Tasty spaces are made to an old recipe handed down by grandmothers and grandfathers. We are seldom consciously aware of it. 
Let me give you one example. The Design Science Department of the University of Arts in Berlin has studied the treatment of objects in everyday life. The authors investigate how the constitution of space as living space, as a tasty space, differs from class to class. Low-income people or families, they found, always arrange goods in the same way. Predominant is a combination of a living room suit, coffee table and wall unit. The furniture is often voluminous and decorated or patterned. Ornamental objects are displayed in the wall unit which often occupies the whole wall. And there are usually only one or two other larger objects in the room. In the middle class household, in contrast, individual, individual objects are not arranged in a wall unit, but situated separately, thus being more strongly involved in the spatial construction. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, Martina, thank you very much for your, for your presentation. The idea that this everyday and the exceptional are only produced through actions um, is, a, is a very interesting point, and it ties into to what you, to, I think, what you were doing. Does the dandy produce or does he reproduce? Um. He's a producer, not a reproducer. We made him a reproducer. He himself is a producer, but uh, that's the man that I think the last dandy was Oscar Wilde. And, and of course he was a producer. And the, the end of Tenditum was the pret a -porter. The, I'm sorry, the? Uh, pret a uh, the, the, the mode. Um, I'm interested by your comment that we can never consume space. I think here in this room, we have several spaces. And these spaces are concurrent in a way. And which space could be a space of consumption? Yeah. At the only, bar outside. Only for the example. one at the bar. And yeah. this is not the space what we con uh, mm -hmm. what we consume. This is the the drinks what we consume. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think maybe it helps when we when we think about spaces as a product of of everyone. Mm -hmm. You have to deal with consumption to a certain extent, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. uh, by the usage of your architecture, but you don't have to, to deal with it in reality. You mm -hmm. can just, you know, uh, think about the future, you can uh, look up on the people and think about their futures, uh, and that's it. That's one, one aspect I want to wanna point out. The other aspect, maybe you mean by this uh, question on the two photos is, let's say, not the main important thing. It's, it's, a, it's a discussion among architectures, architects and, 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 and presentation and publishing and mm -hmm. marketing. Exactly. And this is, you know, uh, just the reality of profession that you have to, to, to set. Don't you have the idea of the individual taste? I mean that everyone, everyone has his, its or her own taste. No, no, no. We have only consumption taste, nothing more. We are all ordered by the consumption and we don't have any taste. And who is consumption? Consumption, well, this is a, consumption is a, a, a badly controlled from the phenomena. It's even not good organized. Uh, it's both, I guess. It's both. It's, it's, for me, it's, uh, you know, I don't want to decide that. I just want to have both aspects when I'm dealing with some of that thing. When I ask my students which pictures they have on their walls, a lot of them have Miro, Kandinsky, or maybe uh, Klee. Yeah? It's always the same story. When I ask them which kind of 
bed they have, they to told me that they very often sleep on the floor. When I <laughs> ask uh, um, architect, they normally tell, uh, tell me other stories, but they always tell the same stories. They have the same idea of taste, but they all believe that this is their individual taste. I mean, they are special. And I think uh, that what you said is exactly the reason that every, most of the young architects are starting with low budget, because mm. they are low budget. But so that's, this is not the same. reason to have a bad taste. No, that's not the reason to, to have a bad taste, of course, that's not. Most of the, of, the, of, the, of the contemporary architects I know, especially also in, in Austria and Vienna, they're living in old farmhouses, living in, living in, 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 in water mills uh, out of the 70th or 18th century. So nobody is asking, he's living in, in, in his own creations. Can you, can you uh, refer on this a little bit? Thank you. For me personally, it's very easy. I don't have the money. <laughs> <laughs> This is a very, very bad answer. You can, you can keep the world only on this sentence, I don't have the money. That's awful. We don't talk about money, absolutely not. Uh, I mean, this man is right. Is, does it make a matter to you to live in a beautiful, gothic, uh, Carriere Gotico, how it is called in Barcelona, uh, by having no money and going to the bank and being, uh, uh, you know, going in these conflicts by having no money and giving and, and getting more uh, money from the bank, or you don't want to have any context to corruption. That's the thing. I think we are living in a world where corruption is the daily thing everybody uh, takes and makes and is, is, is some sort of running, make the world running. So go there to your bank, take the money and live good. <laughs> well, maybe I think they're signaling us from the side that we should uh, maybe, although this uh, discussion is very I, interesting. I, I, I want to answer again or try to answer again this question of this very intelligent man. Uh, Architectures create other space where they don't want to live in it uh, because they are perverts. Sadisten. For the second round in the panel, we're going to go m much more directly to the theme of food to begin with. Uh, first, um, guest on the panel is Fergus Henderson, uh, a very interesting figure, uh, studied to be an architect, thought better of it, and became a cook in London. He is now the chef cook at the restaurant St. John, um, the best restaurant in um, London and one of the 16 best restaurants in the world. Um, our second panelist would be Morris Neo. Morris uh, is an architect, is a principal of Neo Architects in Rotterdam. Um, and our third uh, panelist tonight would be Philip Rahn, principal of Low Architects in Lausanne in Paris. They were the representatives in 2002 uh, at the Swiss Pavilion in the Biennale. So I think we're going to be in for a very interesting panel. And I'd like to welcome Fergus to give us the first presentation for the second round. Ah, good evening. Um, I'd like to start with a couple of um, recollections or memories I have, that I think probably why I'm here now. Both architecture and food. Architecture creates a space that affects people's manners of occupation and behavior in the space. And food, by nature of the food, you serve them you, um, you, you, you're again affecting their behavior. So using this to justify my, my foodie examples, um, say, uh, if you uh, think of dishes in 
grand restaurants that come out of the kitchen. Excuse me. Um, these kind of complicated weaves of ingredients, sort of a kind of impassionate embrace of all these um, ingredients, which arrives at your table, and you 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 have no. Um, involvement, or your, your only role really is to, to, to kind of um, deconstruct, I mean, to, to mess this, this exotic pile up. So it's kind of a, you're served with a fate accompli. It's not, there's no, the, again, the magic hasn't come from, the magic that should be transferred from the kitchen to the table hasn't been allowed to flourish. A bone, at this point, I think is an incredibly useful example. It's a dish that we serve of marrow bones. Um, so this bone arrives with a parsley salad, toast and salt at your table. So vital things like the salt should be added just at the last minute. So the eater is involved in the last minute seasoning and the construction of the dish. That it's, um, even though I particularly like to spread the marrow bone on first, then add the salt and then the parsley salad, it's called Liberty Hall. So it's, 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 you're allowed to express yourself with the food which um, starts, I think, to give us some sort of um, promising kind of, hopefully, there's something there that, that in design that it starts to sort of, if maybe design could uh, use a metaphorical bone in some way to aid its, the process. That um, occurred to me, it was the, um, the linen napkin theory, which um, it's, just, it's just a napkin, but it's, it's a, it's, a, it's a vital tool for wiping your chops, but also it's, 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 it's pleasurable, it feels good. And it's a, it's a small intervention, but incredibly useful, which um, I feel, can, again, is, is when you're kind of creating space, it can be, it's, it's something, if you think of the linen napkin, it's, um, it helps, sometimes it might be helpful with considering the scale of actually what you're going to do, an intervention in the space. It's, um, it, it could be as simple as something as that, that brings a certain kind of richness to the whole thing. And um, I think that's about all, really. Anyway, thank you. There was a time that uh, we thought as an office to combine the architectural practice with a restaurant because we have a nice so, um, yeah, space at the back of our office where now cars are standing and we thought let's get rid of the cars and open up a terrace there and let's uh, cook for people who like uh, Indonesian food because I, was, I am still into, into uh, Indonesian food. But I tend now to uh, drift to uh, the Brazilian and Italian kitchen. And my uh, favorite meal is also spaghetti, but it's the spaghetti puttanesca. Eh? <laughs> and last night, when we had dinner, I tried to make a definition of what tasty space is. Oh. A tasty space is a space which is too spicy, too spicy for nicely streamlined architecture. And I'm not talking only over John Gior about John Gior, yeah, because there are a lot more too coherent, too closed kind of concepts about architecture. A space which is too baroque in the eyes of political correct architects. Mm. We have done uh, research into the role that food plays in the urban public domain. We have talked to food suppliers and providers of space and together with them, we drew up 10 models, varying from a very simple to more complex, from non-profit to commercial, from lean to fat. And one of the first will be in Rotterdam. The city council have uh, asked five developers to come up with proposals for a new market hall, but they don't have a clue what that will be, you know? And it's, of, of course, quite difficult. And we, as an office, uh, are afraid that they come up with just another supermarket, with just another shopping mall, with 
again, a streamlined, totally non-tolerant space. So we feel obliged as an office to make another proposal. And this is the first outcome of the fire emperor. So my presentation will be not only on food and uh, testy space, but uh, uh, there is a, um, a very close relationship between uh, the body and the space. And so food is very important uh, in this idea. And, um, and I was very interested in two, uh, two philosophers. One it is uh, Spinoza. And Spinoza sp spoke about beauty and uh, um, non-beauty uh, uh, with the question of uh, tox intoxication. He says that something awful is something uh, dangerous for the health and, uh, and, and in the niche uh, ph physiology there is uh, this idea that something awful is something that uh, is very close from the rotten food or something of the rotten body and, uh, and the death of the body. Maybe if, um, also another question of uh, senses or um, of uh, uh, comprehension of the space. Uh, it is two projects on the uh, of the idea of um, of the um, of the electromagnetic uh, aspect of the space. So it, it was also a kind of journey into the invisible. Uh, aspect of the space. So the first room, it was a, a white room with full of uh, all the wavelengths of the, uh, of the visible uh, light. And we, su we erase first the red and after the, the blue and the green. And so, and the third uh, room, it was only in uh, purple. And the last room, it is a very close, a very, a very, um, impossible room because it was with the UVC and uh, ultraviolet C and this is an um, uh, electromagnetic wave, very dangerous. It is destroy life and, uh, and the chemical uh, uh, cell of the, of the skin. And so um, you, there is a progression into the space, but it is a, a progression into, into the nanometric variation of the space from the the um, possibility to live into the space to an impossibility to live uh, into the space. Uh, another project, a project in, in Japan, in Kitakyushu, we don't separate the, the bedroom, the living room, and the bathroom. We put all together, but we separate into the different wavelengths. This is maybe an idea of a ghost or a of a parallel um, dimension, and you could imagine that people are living in the, in the same place, but not in the same wavelengths. I think, again, we've had a fairly radically uh, uh, eclectic uh, group of presentations. For example, a tasty space would be something that would sort of overload the senses. Do you think that you're trying to create tasty spaces or are, what are you trying to create through these specific physiological responses? Uh, I think we don't want to create uh, really something, but we, we just want to, to understand that there is relationship between space and uh, body. And so mm -hmm. it's not... Uh, Common. It's uh, because uh, I think uh, at the beginning we don't understand this relationship. Uh, we don't know this relationship be because at the beginning of architecture there is the idea of the something uh, full and something void. Mm -hmm. And it's only with the time that we understand that the void is full of uh, things. Mm -hmm. And so um, today we, there is all this parameter of uh, relationship, and we um, we just. Actually, we want to understand this parameter and uh, to, to work and, and because we know actually that there is relationship. And so when you live into the modern uh, space, you have to understand now that uh, it's not... Uh, and, and so it is a beginning of uh, maybe of uh, a kind of um, augmentation of the dimension of... Uh, of the, uh, of the field of architecture. But I think this is also something, I think there's a direct connection between food and yes. what, you, your, what your body is consuming, not consumption in a mm -hmm. cultural sense, but in a physical sense, what you're bringing into your body. And I think this ties 
uh, ties into into that. I mean, Fergus, would you say that um, that you know that the body responds very directly to these uh, oh, um, impo I mean, inputs? Certainly. I mean, a, a, a great lunch can almost be like a kind of I mean, mind expanding. Um, it's 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 it's, it's, um, it, it's the results of a great lunch are kind of kind of. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Maurice, um, one of your, uh, with the Fire Emperor and absolutely your definition of what a tasty space is, um, is fascinating. The idea of this radical tolerance, which implies at the same time a sort of uh, uh, radical uh, variety or radical um, plurality. Um, but let me ask you, in the fire emperor, or in this definition in general, is it possible within a radical tolerance and a radical plurality to have any taste at all? Or does it become so mixed together that it blurs that they cancel each other out? Yeah, that is a very good question. Uh, the, 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 the art is, of course, of every designer is to create an open space where all the specific characters or elements stay specific. I mean, that's the trick. I mean, th that's also, you know... The almost <laughs> it, impossible. Yeah, no, no, it's not the almost impossible. It's, it, it is possible, but it takes a, a lot of, you know, experience and, and, and yeah, a lot of uh, work uh, to, to get there. And uh, all the work we are doing now is about that, you know, to create a really open space, which is more or less fake, not defined, not, mm -hmm. you know, not censored, and not coherent, not stylized, but it's where all these specific things which you put in, in the design, are still... F uh, Legible. Ex exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But I also think one of the points that, that um, Fergus brought up was also the idea of uh, the relationship of, of, of place and, and the effect of taste, that one can, like the idea of terroir in a French wine, that one can notice the context in which, in which uh, a, a dish or a wine or a building was created. Um, do you believe that the, that comes into architecture as well, that you can create an architecture that has terroir? I'd hope that's possible. It's um, because it seems that there are all these things we do are being done either the side. They're kind of tools to try and give some sort of mm -hmm. something to the building, but it's, it's, um, it's actually kind of capturing that the spirit of the place and, and the, the time. It's sort of, that's this sort of elusive thing mm -hmm. that seems to be kind of a, a troublesome. So you, can, you kind of create tools that you create. You kind of give your space some sort of story and let there, but it's the actual sort of indigenous musk, whatever one's mm -hmm. looking for, that you're trying to sort of, but I mean, that's, um, that's which is what I was trying, that, it's, that's, the, that's the trick, how do you, how do you catch that? And um, it's, it seems that we, a lot of buildings seem to be in actually complete denial of that and mm -hmm. going off on some other tangent. So it's, um, no, not an easy one. <laughs> but um, certainly, I think, a healthy ambition to try and capture that in space. Um, I'd like to ask if anyone in the audience would uh, uh, like to question, pose any questions to our panel now. Actually, we, we have a question from uh, Lausanne. I think it's to Philip Rahm. It's um, question is, um, physiological architecture, um, architecture that can be generalized and um, that can be the future of architecture. Do you think this is possible? Yeah, I think it's not really it's not really interesting to think about uh, what is uh, will be the f future of architecture. I don't, uh, and so we are also a little afraid uh, of uh, this uh, architecture. But we were also afraid from the genetic and all from this transformation of the understanding of the human body and the and the and the and the, and the earth and uh, and so. Uh, um, yes, there is a. I, I think there is a part of the future, but it is not uh, all the future. It's just a part of the future. But, uh. Uh, Fergus, do you believe that there are um, other aspects than the physiological which create 
a comfortable space. Tell us about your restaurant, for example. What is it like there? Is it your ideal space? Um, yes, <laughs> that's not so, so surprising. It would be worrying if it wasn't. Um, but that's, it, um, it actually it gets accused of being rather uncomfortable. I mean, it's, it's a very straightforward eating hall, really. And the, 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 um, the space comes alive. I mean, I think it's beautiful in its own right. Mm -hmm. it, it, it comes alive by you and eating in it. So it's, it's about, uh, it's kind of, uh, it come, it's, it's life comes from everyone tucking into a, a plate of food and a glass of wine and, it's, and the, the atmosphere that comes from the, the smoking and the chatting and the drinking and the general merriment and eating. It's, uh, it's, um, it's, but it's, 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 it, the space itself is quite straightforward. But mm -hmm. What would be interesting is uh, when Fergus uh, decides to uh, re-enter the field of architecture again and mm -hmm. took his experience, you know, like mm -hmm. a chef cook, and then what will the design be? I mean, that would be quite interesting. Yeah. Maybe it's totally more relaxed than what the, uh, we are trying to do, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, one day. Yeah. <laughs> when, the, when, I, when I get out of kitchens. <laughs> I mean, I could go on forever here, but I think <laughs> I'm, known, I'm known to be able to talk. But I think, um, I think we can, with that, we can bring our second panel to an end. There is a winner. A winner. Uh, first, first, I'd like to hear you guys give a little applause for our panel. Before I, I call the winner, the, the second project with just this one vote, it was uh, project number four with, uh, with Alina Dubach, Sarah Miebach, and uh, Mike Ronz, Nim Eins. So just give an applause to them. Uh, so one vote. The first prize was uh, um, a journey to a capital of architecture in Europe, <laughs> whatever it is. So it was the project number two, uh, Brau Solar, by Birgit Brauner, Oliver Hosp, Gabor Koschis, and Richard Steger. So um, we are finishing now for, for tonight. So there's a party outside. Uh, we have uh, good music, I hope, from Lausanne again. Uh, thank you all for being here, and uh, see you next year. Let's enjoy the party.